You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 463. All you need for a movie is a gun and a girl. Jean-Luc Godard. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we have filmmaker Justin McConnell. And Justin is the director of a new documentary called Clapboard Jungle, which explores the painful and brutal journey of a filmmaker trying to get their movie made. And I absolutely love the film, and it's in a great tradition of movies about making movies. And, you know, obviously I made On the Corner of Ego and Desire, which was a love letter to independent filmmakers and how crazy we are. Well, Clapboard Jungle is a great um, companion film to watch as well. It will educate you on the process. It will terrify you. It will make you laugh. It will make you cry. It has everything you need for a filmmaker to enjoy and to be terrified about. But this is a truthful and honest portrayal of the process, and that's why I wanted to have Justin on so we can talk about it a little bit. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Justin McConnell. I'd like to welcome the show Justin McConnell, man. How you doing, Justin? I'm good. How are you? Nice to be on your uh, your lovely program. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the show, man. Uh, I heard about Clapboard Jungle, your your doc about independent filmmaking, and anytime there's a doc about independent filmmaking, I I always like to watch it, and um, uh, I, it is by far, absolutely every independent filmmaker needs to see it. It is required viewing if you want to be an independent filmmaker uh, moving forward in today's world. Uh, it is it is brutal. It is honest. It is depressing. It is hopeful. It has everything inside of it. So, uh, but we're gonna get into all of that. So before we before we get started, man, how did you get into this insane, ridiculous business? Oh man, uh, that goes back a long way. Uh, I mean, if you watch the doc, there's sort of a condensed version of that, where uh, you know, around the age of like 15, I I, I realized I wanted to make movies for a living. Um, and it got solidified more because I used to make little documentaries and stuff for class projects. And and I had, you know, two two shitty VCRs I'd cut together with and I'd pull patches on RCA cables to try and patch in sound and voiceover and stuff like that. Uh, but I always got really high marks on those class documentaries I put together, you know, cutting VHS clips and stuff like that. 
Um, and I got kind of got the taste for editing then. Uh, and so through the end of my high school, I, I started making short films. And I, I even made my first feature film when I was in high school. It's called Strata. Uh, and I organized the film festival around it because a bunch of other people um, <laughs> like in the school presented in our, our auditorium because and invited a bunch of other people to bring in films to play. So it was like a sort of film festival just so somebody would watch my fucking movie. Um but from there, uh, I, I wanted I wanted to do this, so I pursued. Uh, a, at first, I pursued a degree at York University in film and television, um, but I quickly realized that that was far more theoretical and far less practical. And then there was a TA strike, which like solidified um, the fact that I should just drop out and go to a more technical college. So I went to Trevis. I dropped out, took the money, went to Trevis. Um, and then I, I slowly worked my way into the post-production side of things uh, because I figured I, and that's what I took at Travis, too. I, I took uh, film and television post-production because I noticed most of the production classes, less so at Travis, but definitely at York, were very focused on the mise-en-scene and the theory behind film, which is great. But really what they're doing is you're paying them to tell you which textbooks to read. And then mm -hmm. maybe you'll discuss it in class, but it's just it didn't seem to make a lot of sense when I could get all that stuff myself by just buying the textbooks, watching the documentaries, watching the behind the scenes stuff. So I got involved in post-production uh, and right out of Trevis, I ended up getting a job for a commercial company that did uh, TV spots for record labels, Universal, Warner, Rhino, stuff like that. And we were hired, I was hired as what they called a predator, which mm -hmm. uh, is a producer, director, editor. Um, and it is probably an unfortunate term now in 2021, but that's what my job. I, I look at it. I still look at it as a 1987 film that was amazing. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started cutting these TV spots for like Seal and Billy Talent and all these like, uh, you know, I could, I was in a job where I six months ahead of the label launching an artist. I kind of knew who the next big artist was going to be. Uh, but that really got me, um, really got me in a, like thrown into the far frying pan of, of editing. And, uh, and then I started uh, with Unstable Ground, the company that I formed in 2001, officially formed in 2001. I was using that name all through high school too. I started branching out and going to live shows and handing business cards to like to bands and being like, I'll do your music video. I'll do it. And I got a few of those clients. Uh, and then I ended up making music videos for like very, very cheap, but they ended up on broadcast television uh, and getting really high ratings on broadcast TV in the early 2000s for music videos. Mm -hmm. um, and then gradually, I just sort of like worked my way up making short films and continuing uh, <clears throat> to do post-production for various businesses. <laughs> there was one year where I was like simultaneously working for a client that, where I was servicing the Bible League of Canada, the Gideons and the Freemasons all at the same time, <laughs> which was... <laughs> Pretty funny, is and then simultaneously on my on the side making my own horror movies and stuff. So if any of those clients knew what I did on the side, they'd be like, "What the hell?" But then if they knew what, anyway, it was just the weirdest time in my life. I think one mm -hmm. of the weirdest. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. And then in 2004, I, I set out to make my first feature documentary, uh, working class rock star, uh, just out of my own pocket, paying for everything sort of out of my own pocket. That was completed around 2000, early 2007, and then released in 2008. And there's a long story about the distribution of that one and how screwed over I got. And I'll get to that, I'm sure, at some point in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but I sort of built up from there. And I've just been making self-generated features and shorts for years and years and years. And the first, like, narrative feature that I made that did any kind of real real um, distribution uh, was this movie called The Collapsed that I made for, like, $40,000 Canadian up front. Uh, and I... <laughs> I basically went to my to my parents and was like, listen, I'll have this money back to you within a year, which at the time could have been a lie because who knows? Who knows how distribution goes? Uh, and, I, and I used partially my own money from my own pocket and partially that to put together that $40,000. Um, but then the movie got made and Raven Banner picked it up for sales uh, based on a rough cut. And then we sold it to Japan and that gave me enough money to finish the movie. Then Anchor Bay picked it up for a bunch of territories. Then Lionsgate picked it up for the UK. So on that forty thousand dollars, once all the deferrals were paid out, the budget was probably more like one hundred and five thousand Canadian. Uh, but I paid all the deferrals and made a profit, and that kind of just it gave me, I guess, the confidence to go, okay, I really need to understand how the business side of the business works if I'm going to be successful. And then that sort of spun into the last decade or so of my life, where I've slowly been trying to build my career um, and get bigger films made. Obviously, I got Life Changer made a few years ago, and uh, I've now got Clapboard Jungle, which was another out-of-pocket kind of deal. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do owe a percentage of my career to like my parents taking a chance on me uh, and, and me going to them and being like, listen, can I borrow this? Uh, uh, and they 
you know, they, them taking a chance. I mean, I'll have to admit that right off the top, off the top, because a lot of people. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Like it's different now because the technology is way cheaper. So you can, you can buy a DSLR and, and go out with five grand and, you know, shoot basically what I did with the collapsed for 40 grand, like the, the, the price is lower. So you have more opportunity now, but back then, you know, um, if I wanted to shoot on a red, if I wanted to, you know, bring in a, an actual crew, even though they were working for like low rates and then a deferral beyond that and stuff, there, there was, I had to put real money down to make even a tiny movie like that. Uh, and nobody else was going to take a chance on a first time filmmaker at the time. And then within, within a year, like I said, they were paid back and that was, uh, not going to be the, the story for everybody, but it worked <laughs> for me. <laughs> so the one thing, the one, well, first of all, why did you want to make Clapboard Jungle? Okay. Well, um, I just finished my last documentary, Skull World, uh, that got released in 2013 and it was early 2014. And I realized I had this like slate of projects I was trying to get made. Uh, at the time, the two big ones were the Eternal and Tripped. And I, I realized that it's probably going to take me a long time for me to actually get these, uh, these films made. So I wanted to do something in the meantime that I could use whatever side money I was making from my business that wasn't going towards cost of living to kind of create something and be producing as I go. And I realized that if I'm going to spend the next few years trying to make movies anyway, and and there really isn't that many documentaries out there about how you get a movie made and then how you sell a movie. Uh, a lot of like filmmaking stuff documentaries that, that are that exist or, or like the story of how one movie came together or or like an american movie kind of thing where the dreams are bigger than the realities or um or i guess seduced and abandoned is one where like alec baldwin goes around con to try and yeah somewhat yeah. something like that that's somewhat the same um but there, there wasn't really something from the like grassroots indie perspective of somebody who's like far removed from the business and how you would break in so i thought well that's a good idea for a movie and since i'm simultaneously going to be doing that anyway it's a way to keep my costs down super practically because if I turn the camera on myself, first of all, I can afford that. I couldn't afford to shadow somebody else for four or five years uh, and live their life with them because you need real, you, I would need like a ridiculous amount of financing to do that because I, I have to live my own life too. Um, so I, I, the, I made the practical decision to turn the camera on myself basically. And, uh, and uh, they started from there and I just started gathering interviews when I could by just reaching out to people and, it was all very grassroots. It was like, well, what can I afford? Okay, basically nothing. So I'll buy some super cheap gear and just start going. And then it's now seven years later and it's coming out and the TV series <laughs> version is coming out too. So, you know, it was, it was very much like, a, I don't know, like writing a book or something. It's, it's a, it was a self-driven kind of process for this, this documentary. The one thing I've, well, watching the documentary, I, first of all, I felt a, a kindred spirit, uh, because, uh, we're all insane, uh, for doing what yeah. we do. Can you discuss a little bit? And I think you touched upon this at the beginning, which I, I think you and I are of similar vintage as far as age is concerned. Uh, I'm almost 40. Yeah. So we're close. We're close. Um, and I also came up in post-production, um, been doing, I did post-production for 25 years, uh, and, you and I could probably talk post-production horror stories, uh, clients in the room, yeah. <laughs> all that, all that kind of great stuff as well. But I, I've talked a lot about over the years, I've talked about something called the lottery ticket mentality. And I think it's something mm -hmm. that's very um uh it's something that is so ingrained in our generation because of the 90s, because of of Tarantino and Rodriguez and Smith and Linkletter and Singleton. And Spike mm -hmm. and all of those guys. It, it was that time period of I think probably all of the '90s. It started more early '90s, but that whole time is where we we were seeing the 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 lottery ticket. Like every month, there was a new million dollar deal, and Ed Burns would show up with Brothers McMullen, or Linkletter would show up with Slacker, or Kevin Smith with with Clerks, and and it just and in our minds, we were just like. Oh, I have to make one of those too, and and I have to yeah. and I have to blow up too, and maybe if I go to Sundance, and maybe if I make a movie and submit to Sundance, I'll get that. And there's a whole generation of guys our age um, that had to deal with that. And you talk about it pretty on the nose in the documentary. Can you discuss that a little bit and what you dealt with, well, and and how'd you break out of it, or are you still dealing with it? <laughs> 
See, it's a difficult qu uh, question because, yeah, obviously, growing up, that's exactly what what the 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 dream was, right? You know, you you become one of those indie filmmakers that breaks out and like the world's your oyster for a bit. And and but I think I feel like at a certain point I realized that was always just kind of a lie. Like it was always sort of a spin uh, because for every Kevin Smith or Quentin Tarantino or, you know, Alison Anders or whoever else, there was probably a hundred other people that we didn't hear the stories of, but their movies still got made. And, and, and uh, now there's a thousand other people who we're not hearing of, but, but their movies still got made because of how much easier it is to actually make a movie now. So I think what broke me out of it most was probably getting conned. But because I in the in the early 2000s, I had this mentality like when I made working class rock star, I mean, the movie is is rough around the edges. I shot it on a DVX 100, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, but it, it has some sellable, uh, sellable stuff to it. And I ended up being uh, I turned down the first producer's rep. And, but then this is this is the kind of thing that happens when people are green and they, they, they have this um, this, you know, big hit lottery ticket mentality is there are people out there that prey on that mentality. So I ended up signing with a producer's rep uh, who I, re will remain nameless, but I did write a big blog post about it where I named him because he's actually being actively sought by police in, in both Canada and the U.S. right now. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah. Because uh, he defrauded an old folks home in Barry. No. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> just, I can't even believe yeah, it. <laughs> he was a career con man. Anyway, he signed me on uh, and I, I still re distinctly remember the first meeting, right? I've got this finished documentary film. And I just want, I've never been to a film market. I have no idea what any of this shit is. And I, I just want somebody to shop it around. So it, it's very much a big talk kind of thing. And I was, this would have been 2007, I think. Uh, so, you know, I would have been significantly younger and I had no idea how to sell a movie at this point. I just was trying to figure this shit out. Uh, and I remember him going through his phone and showing me photos. Here's me with Anna Ferris. Here's me with, you know, like, like flipping through all these like photos and going, okay, this guy's, I'm thinking this guy's legit. He, he knows these people. Like, I don't know this business from Adam. <laughs> I, I just do post-production. I'm in a little fucking closet. Uh, I hope I can swear on this. I can't. You know. It's too late now, but you know, that's no, fine. That's okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I remember him flipping through this stuff. So I signed a deal, but the red flags that I should have clued on into, but I didn't know was he wanted a retainer, which was five grand. Oh, yeah. you, you, got wanted, off, you, uh, you got off uh, easy. My, my first producer was 10 grand. So I got screwed oh, for 10. <laughs> then he wanted a $3,500 publicity retainer. Of course. Uh, and then he wanted to be the one to handle buying my E&O insurance. So that would be another 6,000. So oh, all in all, oh, oh, yeah. Oh. So all in all, I, I got took for maybe 14,000, but it, it's the wow. emotional part of that, that really drove home the point that, Oh, I'm getting screwed and, and I got to get smarter about the business and it doesn't work where you just get it. Cause he, he did go to Berlin. He, he went, he went to Berlin. Uh, also there was this whole side thing where he, he was dying of cancer at the time, or at least that was what he told me. And, um, he goes Jeez. to Berlin and I get all these texts in my phone. Like we just sold Israel for 10,000. We just sold, and I'd be getting those for days and days and days and days. And it added up to like well over $140,000 in international sales that he told me I had. Um, and, and I'm like, I'm green at the time, obviously. And I was, I'll admit that was, it was dumb for me to like buy into, holy shit, this thing's actually selling. And because I made the movie for like 30 grand or something, let's say mm -hmm. over a period of three years. Um, so I'm getting all these texts and then there was just dead silence for a, a while and I'm reaching out and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, okay, uh, if, if you got all these deals, where are the deals? Like, can I see the contracting? Can I see the offers? Can I see the deal memos? None of that came in. So I started doing some due diligence and digging and realized that the contract I'd signed for this producer's rep, that like his agreement, the address on it was actually the address of a gym that wasn't any like no offices in it, anything like that. Just he must have thrown a dart or something. Um, and, and I kept digging more and more. And it turned out he'd also defrauded the movie uh, Free Enterprise. Uh, they, they had a sequel to that that mm -hmm. they were planning. And he, he took the money and ran on that. There was uh, this big um, it was called The Publicist. It was going to be a television series based upon publicists around the Toronto Film Festival. He took all the money and ran from that. And he's one of the co-producers on Pawnee So I always make the joke that I indirectly helped co-finance Pawnee to some degree, because he made that directly after he defrauded me of this sort of money. Um, but the point being is that uh, that was kind of my first wake up call. And then when the movie started getting distributed, the distributor took it on. And I don't blame the distributor. Of, I don't blame Cinema Epoch who took on the movie for this happening. But as soon as I got signed, 
because uh, Greg's actually a pretty solid the guy. Like I'm, this is not their fault, but they were being handled by Koch at the time for uh, for distribution. Like their actual titles were Koch titles. They go through Koch, and then E1 bought it Koch, and this was directly after I'd signed. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So basically my release got forgotten completely uh, is, and kind of just dumped into the market. And then I signed TV rights to another company that doesn't exist, uh, Peace Arch, who went into creditor protection after selling my movie to Super Channel for like 20 grand. So I, I never saw a cent from that either. So I, I did actually make these sales of this first movie, but ultimately, and I had paper for it, but ultimately I didn't see a cent from any of those sales. So it was like, okay, I got to get smarter and I got to, control my career in, in a much more focused way and sort of grab the reins. And that's sort of how I rolled into, you know, making the collapse and actually seeing a return on that and working with people I could trust because I, I think I just got a better radar for who's fucking feeding me bullshit compared to who isn't. <laughs> and, that, and I started working with Raven Banner in like early 2010 or late 2000. I went to AFM in 2009. That was my, that was my second year at AFM, but I had a, a finished film. I went in 2008, trying to shop a pre, uh, like a, trying to get an MG, like a pre-sale for a movie and then to make. Mm. And then I realized I should have a product when I come back in 2009. So by 2000 or 2010, sorry. So it was 2009 was the first year, 2010 was the second year. So I came back with, uh, with a, a basically a finished film, uh, at least a, enough of a rough cut that I could tr start shopping it. And I met with the Raven Banner guys and I'd never looked back in terms of international sales with those guys. Cause they, they deliver They're They're really trustworthy. Um, and I, I like, they're just really good people. And they came from like one of the co founders of Raven Banner left a particular distribution company where that constantly burned their filmmakers and went, fuck this. I can't work for this anymore. And started Raven Banner specifically because he didn't want to burn filmmakers. Anymore. He, could, he couldn't sleep at night. So he had to yeah, do something. Exactly. Right. Well, but he wasn't, he wasn't personally doing it, but he couldn't deal with it anymore. Yeah, exactly. It was, he was working for a company that was doing this. And he was like, uh, you know, he, he, I, I have friends who, who had films distributed by this previous company who've told me, you know, they were, they were in tears on the phone trying to collect money from these people. And like, cause there's, especially in the indie level, when you're putting your own money into something, you, uh, it's not just an, like, it's bad enough when it's an investor, it's, it's probably to some degree worse, but when it's your own money and you're like scrounging through couch cushions to, to put, to buy enough pasta to eat something, you know, or whatever. And then you, you're owed like thousands and thousands of dollars by someone, which is like a blip to, compared to the money they actually take in. Um, it, it can be really, really disheartening. And, uh, and I get it. I get why someone would be that emotional on the phone about something like that. Anyway, long story short is that was the wake up call. And then I just, I dove head first into trying to learn as much as I could about the business as possible. I went to AFM every year. Then I started going to con every year. I went to Berlin I, I, and I go to like smaller markets. I, I and, uh, started working with two different distributors, uh, started working as a film festival programmer, started my own short film festival, just as much as I could to be on all sides of the business while keeping the post-production going just so that I, a, I don't get screwed over as much anymore. And B, I know what I'm talking about when I'm in a meeting with somebody so that when they say something that doesn't ring true, I can go, Hmm. Okay. You know, that's kind of where I'm at. That seems, that seems shady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's like, yeah, if, you, when you hear those things in those meetings, oh God, I, I mean, I mean, the stories, I mean, everyone listening knows my stories because I've talked about them so much and written books about them and, and, and everything. It's just such a, it's you such a with sales projections, right? Like if you get oh, someone get me and then you, I'm, I'm working directly with, with an international sales company that I know is honest and gets honest fucking numbers. And, and, and that, so when somebody gives you sales projections or something and you're like, there's no way that's making that in the market right now as it exists. There's no friggin' way. It, it, it really does temper the kind of meetings that you, you end up, uh, the type of people you get into bed with, I guess is the way I would phrase that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if I'm, right now, making money with films in general is almost impossible. That's for everybody. For, we're, I mean, Warner Brothers is having issues. Like, you know, I mean, everybody is having issues because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So any and, and that's at the top level. Can you imagine what these lower, small distribution companies, they're just struggling to survive. And I think Pretty that much. and I think that the predatory 
aspect of the distribution side of business is getting worse and worse and worse. It will continue to get worse and worse as that pressure continues to tighten on mm -hmm. them. So you know, before there was a little bit of fat that they, but now it's getting so, th and they were screwing filmmakers when it was fat. Can you imagine when they're not, when they're thin or, or, or yep. really lean, they're going to be screwing filmmakers left and right. Uh, and and one, one thing also that I want people to understand, you were, <clears throat> you've been chasing your dream now for you know, 20 odd years, probably. Um, 25, but yeah. 20, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and you were smart enough to like, well, I'm going to build a business to support my my habit, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And and you're, you decided to go into post-production, which was the exact path I went down because I figured, well, post is definitely a skill that a director needs. Uh, mm -hmm. It adds a tremendous amount of value to any endeavors that I'm going to work on as a director because I don't have to worry about post anymore. Like I can't even comprehend budgeting post. I don't budget post because I'm like, well, I'll just do it. I'll edit it. I'll color correct it. I'll VFX supervise it. I'll post supervise it. I, you know, it's, it's something I could do myself. Um, but that was something really smart where I see other filmmakers who like, I'm going to work at Starbucks to follow my dream. I'm like, dude, it's going to be a rough road for you. Would you agree? I would agree that um, if you're really serious about pursuing filmmaking as a career, the more you can work in a peripheral business that's related enough to the career that you still gain additional skill sets that will help you in that career. I think that's a much smarter path than just like going, well, I need a day job. I should just get a day job because you also have room for growth if you do that. So it, whether it's post or whether it's like working set work as a, you know, starting as a PA and then becoming sure. a third AD and working your way, like those are actually applicable experiences to what you want to do down the road. So it makes more sense because those opportunities are out there. If you, you know, it, it might take you a while to land the ones you really like. I mean, I've in post, I've worked on tons of stuff that I'm embarrassed to. to oh, <laughs> to, oh. To, and for, you know, like client work is client work. The art is the art. And sometimes the client work it, ends up being art, which is great, but it doesn't mean you can only, f you have to fill, anyway, that's a rant. Um, the point being is that I, I do think it was, it was, it was a very good decision to, to head the post direction. Um, I think it helped me a lot. Uh, I mean, f the obvious one is it saves a lot of money, like you said, I, I, when it comes to the actual post-production process. Um, and also because you can talk to the post people and get what you want specifically, because you know exactly what you want. Um, if you're, if you have a team, like I had more, I had a final post team on life changer doing VFX and grading and stuff like that, that I wasn't doing, which was refreshing. Um, and even on clapboard jungle, I, I knew that, well, first of all, if I'm turning the camera on myself, uh, I run the risk of making a, some kind of a vanity project. And that was the last thing I wanted. Uh, and so I needed second and third sets of eyes. I brought in, uh, Kevin Burke to, to edit the film with me. Uh, he, he's the director of a movie called 24 by 36 and, uh, and he's a really brilliant editor and a co-producer named Daryl Shaw to call me on my bullshit the whole process so that uh, so that I wasn't too close to the material. Um, I kind of look at bringing in extra post help in, in a way, uh, a creative way, uh, having extra eyes, having extra feedback and stuff like that. But, yeah, I think whatever you can do to work within the industry, even if it's not directly related, like, I think Corey Moose has got a great quote. In the in the documentary where he says, "Oh, you want to be a director? Fuck you!" Yeah, he has a great quote. Well, great quote. Well. You know, great. You can be a director and absolutely work toward that and put all your effort into that or all your whatever side whatever you don't need to do to stay afloat. Put put work into that by all means. But if that's all you want to do and you don't do anything else peripherally to build your experience and to to keep, put food on the table, you know, just you're not really. You're not really getting a, a broader picture of, of, of what you can be uh, learning and what you, you know, how you can grow. I, and I'll fully admit, like, I, it, it's been a long climb for me to, like, improve as, a, as an artist and a, even a post-production person. Like, it's, it's you, you got to start somewhere. And if your starting point is, I want to be a director, and then 10 years later, you're still at, I want to be a director, and you spent 10 years working at a coffee shop, if that's all you can get, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. You got to do what you got to do to put food on the table. But if you didn't even try to figure out some kind of a peripheral business or a way to stay in the industry while still working toward your dream and that job in the industry that you've built for yourself or that you've gotten for yourself, it has kept you afloat all that time. 
then I, I, I feel like you're definitely going to be at a disadvantage years down the line. And that, that's how I would put it. And and that quote was uh, to put it in context because because you want to be a director, fuck you, which is great. But what he was saying earlier is like a lot of filmmakers come up like I just want to be a director. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I am, you know, like he's going to wear the monocle and the bullhorn and he's going to come in like Cecil D. DeMille. And, and, there, and I don't know about you, in my post suite, I had those directors. I had those yep. directors who didn't even understand what a quick time was. Like mm -hmm. they couldn't even grasp what I was doing in post production. And I'm like, how did you get a million dollars? Like who gave you a million dollars? And I would get upset. And how old are you? You're 20 what? Fuck you. Like it was just got me so angry because they were just so like and and most of those, I think almost all of the directors, they never made a second movie or they never continued down that path because they didn't uh, have that other skill set. And in today's world, you need to have so many other skill sets besides just being a cool director. Like you under, need to understand writing, you need to understand post, you need to understand how to deal with uh, the politics on set, you need to understand marketing, you need to understand social media. It's, I mean, it's sad because you wish you could be like the olden days where you all you needed to do was to be a director, show up on set, and you had a, a crew of a hundred people who were all professionals at the highest level to do what to to bring your vision to life. But in today's world. That doesn't really happen. And and all of those like well, it does it at the higher levels. But but even then there. Yeah, but even yeah. then, man, Michael Bay understands a lot more than just how to how to you know frame a shot. David Fincher is one of the most technical directors on the planet right now. Chris Nolan knows I mean, these guys are not just I'm gonna show up, oh, I don't even know what a camera is. That's icky. No, like that's that's not these guys. So everybody, even at the highest levels, I think have to understand other aspects of the business. I think it is a myth that you could just show yeah. up and be a director. If you don't understand a script, if you don't understand what a good story is, how it's constructed, the basic understanding of myth, understanding of story structure, even though you might not do it, but you need to understand it. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement. Um, I think there's there's that old adage that filmmaking is a language, right? Or it's a conversation you're having with your audience. But I would probably uh, diversify that a bit more and say filmmaking is multiple languages. Uh, and you need to know how to speak each one. So you need to know how to talk to makeup people. You need to know how to talk to your post team. You need to know how to talk to your camera team. You need to know how to talk to actors. You, and these are all different ways of speaking. They're all different, uh, different aspects of one big industry and one big art form. And if you don't take the time to understand how to speak the language of those departments and of those, uh, you know, distributors speak entirely differently too. Oh. Uh, uh, film festival programmers have their own sort of like in speak kind of like, if you don't take the time to really understand and the audience is a whole other conversation, that's a completely different language, you know, actually de de delivering your story and your art, completely different language. So it's, it's almost like, you need to be multi multilingual in the sort of entrenched individual department languages of the business in order to effectively communicate a vision or a goal or anything in this business. And if all, your only language is director, everybody's going to be like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Yeah, I, that's, that's how I would phrase it. I would I would agree with you 100 uh, percent. Now, with your journey um, and this is something I mean, I, I think yeah. it's important to mention that, you know, oh, we, always the, the word guy is, a, is an adage for everything. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, now, there in during your journey of making your films, <clears throat> how important is cast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely the most important. And, and, uh, you know, it took me a while to really realize that. And I, I gave, I self excused myself a lot where I would say, well, I don't really have the money for a great cast. So, I mean, I just have to take what's available to me. And part of that gave me the excuse in my earlier days to kind of be lazy with casting to some degree. I mean, earlier on, it, all you can really get is your friends and sometimes you're lucky and your friends are good actors. Um, but even when I made the collapsed, not every role was ideal in that one. Um, I do think that in their own right, uh, all the actors that I got are relatively talented, but uh, I don't know if they 
really fit the roles, not all of them. And I'm not being specific. I'm just saying that like as an overall ensemble, I'm not sure if the casting was the wisest sort of decision, especially given the, uh, the short production time. And anyway, the point being is that, uh, and that's happened like you, in, especially in the non-union world, if you're, you know, if you're, if you don't have the budget to be able to afford somebody who's really super seasoned, it, it takes extra time to find somebody who's, who really fits a role can live in that role. And, um, and, and doesn't feel like somebody who's just trying to, to be an actor or just trying to act. Um, I, I think casting is probably one of the most important things uh, for any film, uh, simply because it, it could be a great script. It could be you could be a brilliant director. You could uh, you could have incredible financing. And this happens with big movies, too. Like, you know, you could have every resource in the world. But if the cast isn't right, the thing that actually is there holding the audience's attention, that's the 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 first thing that will get your film dismissed is bad casting or uh, or poor performances or just like there's stigma in the business too when it comes to like independent film because uh if it's not somebody somebody has seen before a lot of the audience already jumps to the assumption that oh this is a, a nothing film and these are just like you know the feed, uh, local theater actors or something like it, you you basically need to find a way to make it so that that stigma that audience that is watching your film looks past the idea that these are not people they've seen before uh past the idea that you don't have a lot of budget and sees the character within the act the actual actor's performance and you're not going to get that if you've miscast or if you didn't take enough effort to truly find somebody who really works for the role and it's not just their performance that matters it's also their attitude on set and how willing they are to to you know embrace the actual vision of a film as opposed to like you know some actors you can cast them and they'll have their sort of own agenda what they want to get out of it because they mm -hmm. have presupposed that this film's not going to be very good anyway so they just want those one or two scenes that they can use for their reel to help their career down the line so they're going to toss out any sense of effort to do anything more than that um you got to kind of avoid people like that uh who are who are just there to climb a ladder and are just doing your project simply because you know, oh, I read this this scene I'm going to be in, and it's it's got some cool effects in it, and that's going to look great on my reel. And it's it's not like it can go both ways. But I would say that uh, you know that's really important casting, and then uh, finding the time to either rehearse or you know really talk about the character dynamics with your cast really helps a lot too. And these are things that I've gradually learned over the years, and I, I'm getting better at. And I'm still everybody's improving. Uh, and the hope is my next narrative feature, you know, will be even, even more, be even better cast. And uh, it's, it's, it's a big question. Uh, but yeah, yeah, casting is probably the most important thing. I mean, the story is really important. But right. I, On a market, you know, a marketability standpoint. Yeah, cast. Yeah. But without the cast being, you know, believable and sellable and uh, not sellable to the level of like, you've got A-listers or whatever, but believable and like, they just feel authentic to the role they're supposed to be playing. You you basically have shot your film in the foot right from the start because there's too much competition. There's just too much. And and you also said something like that actors will like will do a scene just for their reel. But uh, I've had experience where the cinematographer does it, the production designer does oh, it, yeah, yeah. that they'll just jump on your show because – and then you'll see that the DP is taking – a little extra shot long to make this one shot because he knows that's going to be on his reel, but it's screwing your day. Um, yeah. That happens I mean, I, as well. I, I think I've been lucky enough that that hasn't necessarily happened. I've, I've worked with really good crew people. Uh, I mean, it, I, there was a music video I made back in the early early 2000s where I got actual government – like Canada – for a while had a, a music video grant where you can get upwards of 30 grand to make a, it's a, from the government basically to make a music Jesus. video. And uh, so I got 15,000 for this music video in, the, in like 2004. Uh, and I thought, Oh, I've got all this money. Well, I'll hire better crew people. So I went out and I, I hired moonlighting uh, union uh, crew people, union camera people. And it, my day got so fucked. It was crazy. Let's just put it that way. It was, it was like, Oh, they really don't care about being here. They're here for 12 hours. They're here for their paycheck and then they're walking or they're getting overtime. And that's like their whole reason for being on set. And when this is your camera and electric team, it's like, Oh, okay, you're done. I'm screwed. And so that day was like, a, I, I, the video got done, uh, but it didn't, I had a vision in my head and I had enough time to do it. And then I had to cut my shot list in half. And that was of just, course. that was a, like a hard experience for me to go, okay, I really got to be smart with cast with uh, crew and with who I bring in and get a feel for them as people before I start working with them. Because 
it, it, you know, you don't really know until you get to set, but at least you can get a, some sense of the fact that they're actually in it for the pay is nice, but they're in it for helping you tell the, the story you want to tell or the vision you want to tell to the best possible level with the resources you have. Uh, it, like a good crew and a good cast working together is, is how movie magic happens. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. If, you, if one of those is weaker, you know, that, then you end up with a troubled production that uh, can, can really, really hurt the final product. I mean, and that has happened in the past, too. Now, is as you were going through your journey of trying to get these projects made, isn't the most brutal and most terrifying words and also mixed with the most hopeful words you can hear is, oh, the money's going to drop tomorrow? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've been uh, I've been good good along the well, a good part along the way to having multi million dollar movies financed several times at this point, and uh, I literally don't trust that a movie is going to happen and get finished until we're in the first week of production at this point. And even then, it oh no, apart. even oh even yeah, I'm, I'm I, 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 it's for me it's post because once it's in post, I know I can control it and I can finish it. Yeah, yeah, you can finish it. Exactly. I, but yeah. until then, like I've seen I've seen projects uh, mid yeah. midway have to be dropped. I was on a project where it was a union, it was a non union shoot, it was outside the circle in L.A. Um, someone flipped this flipped the flipped the the crew. The union went out. They shut down for a month to find the rest of the money that because now they had to pay all the union rates. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And they shut and it screwed everybody up. And it was with major stars in it, major indie stars like people that really. And they said, and then after that, it took nine months for them to finish it in post. So I, I, I had it in my hard drives, on my hard drives for nine months with major stars, and they couldn't get it finished. It happens. Yeah, there's definitely tons of stories of movies that like are halfway through production and then the plug gets pulled. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but there was something a few years ago. I was brought on as a VFX supervisor on a movie that is just now finishing their final sound mix. But this was like three or four years ago when I was like finding the getting the VFX quotes and trying to put it together. And it ultimately they ultimately took their business off to off to I think Vietnam. They had a they had a sure. VFX company in Vietnam do it. It was significantly cheaper. But it's now three or four years later, and it's just literally just now finishing final sound post. And this is a movie that is probably about two mil. That easy, maybe two point. And it, and and does it have any major stars in it? No, not really. It's it's mostly so. creature stuff that made it cost what it cost. And I mean, I'm not. I can't judge that production scenario because I don't know all the ins and outs of their financing or sure, anything sure, like sure, that. Sure, 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 sure. But just from my own sort of experience with it, it's like, oh, I can't imagine sitting on on a movie like this for four years trying to get it get it done. And, and, and just hearing what you just told me, two million dollar film, horror creature, no stars, yeah. they'll never make their Monday's oh, Probably not. Never they, make. They might have ten years ago. Absolutely. Then again, then again, they might, depending on how the financing came together. So if it was because it's a co-production, mm -hmm. it's possible that enough of the money is soft money uh, that doesn't have to be paid back. That they will see, they might break even. But I, I doubt it. Oh God, man! It's uh, a day's it, world. It's, just, it's such oh, a yeah. it's a maybe. Let's put it that way. It's a maybe. Definitely, given the current what people are actually buying things for right now, oh. and the current like it probably not unless it was like eighty percent soft money. Maybe, Dude, maybe. I. I I just I just was talking to a producer yesterday who I was watching I was on Hulu flipping through and I saw his movie fly by who has major star major stars in it uh and and they go and I go hey let me ask you how much did you how much did you get paid from Hulu for that cuz I mean that's it was it was like it was really nicely positioned in Hulu hmm. and they're like oh man we got 30 grand yeah yeah I mean, I'm not going to say the, the number for when Life Changer was on Netflix for a year, but, uh, you know, they bought it for a bunch of territories for uh, I was surprised. Let's just put it that way. I was like, yeah, it's you, not. You're, you're kidding me. Yeah, like, it's, it's not. It's not <laughs> it's what not it, original. Yeah, it's not it's what not it used like to an be. Official original. Yeah, it's, it's not what it's, it, it's. It's insane. And that's the weird. That's the new. That's the new um, uh, golden ticket right now is, oh, we'll get our movie sold to Netflix. And it's like, no, so. I mean, it's great. It's at, I, I, we were number one trending for like two days with Life Changer, which is awesome. I mean, it looks good on like, uh, hey, we were on, we were top on Netflix for a couple of days. It looks good trying to pitch for the next movie, but um, it, the the amount that the, the streamers are paying for content right now, unless you're an anointed original and you aren't going out on any other platform, is 
very low, uh, very, very low. And, and I'm not going to get into specific dollar amounts, uh, but like, and it, and it's a sliding scale too. Netflix probably pays the most, you know, and the next level down is, I'm, I'm not even going to say, uh, you know, and when it comes to, then when you come to, it comes to Amazon prime, Oh, a lot of those indie films on prime are making like one cent for every hour stream. Yeah. And, and then they're getting more fees taken off out of that. Like it's, and that's dropped over just over the last three years. It used to be, I think it was only three years ago. It was 22 cents an hour. And it, it's literally it, one cent now. It's, <laughs> yeah, I know. Because before 22 cents, you could actually, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you could actually make really good makes, money. If you properly promote it, you could have. Um, yeah. And, but now and, it's and gone. Then, yeah. And now Prime's going through and tear, tearing down anything that uh, is relatively lower budget looking or like they're, or whatever doesn't perform to the level that they're actually making any money. They just take it down. It's like, you can't resubmit this. Uh, I sold Broken Mild, film of mine to Hulu. Well, Gravitas sold it, but mm -hmm. anyway, uh, this movie, Broken Mild to Hulu, back when Hulu was buying indie stuff mm -hmm. for uh, for flat fees as opposed to – That's what I got. Yeah, that's what yeah. I got. And I got a pretty solid sale out of Hulu, but even that solid sale was relative to the budget of the film, which was quite low. So it, it, it wasn't it wasn't a lot of money. Um <laughs> And I think the thing that I, is really important is that the way you make your money back now is you've got to diversify across as many possible outlets and platforms as possible because one isn't going to do it. It's it's probably going to be multiple unless you're lucky enough to par partner with Netflix from the start and do one of their 130% deals on an original. Like there's uh, uh, XYZ did this a few years ago where they made a series of $2 million films for Netflix. And I don't know if Netflix is necessarily doing this level of film anymore because they're making bigger and bigger and bigger stuff. But the deal was, is that Netflix owns world rights, but, and they, but they pay 130% of the budget. So, you know, you get your 2.6 or whatever it is on your, and that's all you'll ever see. But, um, that sort of thing can, can be good for you. But oh uh, Netflix, yeah. Oh if yeah. If it's a massive hit though, if, if everybody in the world watches it, you're not going to be profit participant in that, you know? So, you know, they could start an entire franchise on the back of this thing that you've just built. And, you know, by the time the 10th part comes out, you've only ever made that extra $600,000 as a production ever kind of thing. So it's like. And, 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 and I want to kind of do a little myth busting here uh, for everyone listening. So your film was trending number one in Netflix. Um, yeah. So when they actually backed up the truck of money and dumped it into <laughs> your front yard, did you have a problem counting all that cash that that, that, that was coming in because well, you were no, number one they, trending? <laughs> they used UPS and they drove past my place and I never saw it. <laughs> exactly. Uh. But you see, that's the thing. But that's the thing that, that these yeah. kind of sometimes these predatory producers reps or, yeah. or sales oh, reps or distributors – they're like, oh, our film was trending number one, and this filmmaker, and look, we got this film to trend number one. And it means nothing. It means I absolutely think, nothing. Other than like promotional, other than promotional well, things like promotional, that. Promotional, but also I think it's because after it left Netflix, uh, Showtime picked it up for a year and a bit. Uh, and I think it's possible that th that helped it in terms of ammo to pitch to Showtime and say, grab this. And I think we've got a third window coming up with a different platform. You know, it's gradually less money each time. But uh, I do think as an overall package to try and pitch your film to other platforms that's a great thing to be able to say absolutely but but it doesn't translate into actual real world dollars it just translates into someone else might take a chance on this next time or or the, or the next window there's, kind there's of better potential is basically yeah. is what it is it's better exactly. is better potential and that's uh, the other thing about even getting on netflix is like you know i don't think they would even consider my film if i hadn't done festivals around the world won a bunch of awards uh had like a hundred positive reviews 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, like all these things are the reason that it was picked up for, by Netflix, I think. I don't think it was just, oh, this film's interesting. It was just, it was literally like, okay, there's clearly an audience. So we might as well just throw a little bit of money behind this and put it on the platform. That was, yeah. That was, and, and so that's another thing. Like you had to do, that was a lot of work to get all that. Like to oh, get a yeah. hundred reviews and all this other stuff. Um, it, it's like there's so much more that you need to do now than you did in 2004 to make money with yes. a film. There's so yeah. much more uh, that you need to do as a filmmaker, which they don't teach you in film school. They don't teach you they about don't. marketing. They don't teach you about social media. They don't teach you about Rotten Tomato reviews. They don't teach you about algorithms. They don't teach you about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it's even like, how does Rotten Tomatoes work? Nobody really <laughs> yeah. knows. Like, it's very, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, 
there are very set sort of parameters and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, do you know why a movie is considered uh, certified fresh? I mean, the, the breakdown is super simple. It's right there on their website. But most people don't really understand that you need 40 reviews. If you're a limited release film, you need 40 reviews. Five of those have to be, sorry, you need 40 reviews with a percentage higher than 75%. Five of those reviews have to be from top critics, like they're they're anointed top critics, uh, and 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 then once you've hit that threshold, then you can be certified fresh. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So if you've got twenty nine reviews, but you're ninety five percent, and you've only got one top critic in there, then you're out shit out of luck, kind of thing. So it's like. There's, there's all these sort of like inner workings. If you're a wide release film, you need 60 reviews. You know, it's, it's there's all these sort of like um, uh, just background. I don't know where I'm going with this. But the point <laughs> being is that all these sort of sites like IMDb and their weighted average system can totally Ugh. fuck your, your movie too. Like there's all this. And then the Google, like Google, when somebody's searching for your film, always auto uh, ranks Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb and stuff like that. Uh, and I guess Letterboxd now right up at the top of all your search stuff. So, you know, if you're early on in your release and you've had two reviews and one was positive and one was negative and those are the only reviews displaying anywhere, those are going to be the top of the Google ranking. And I've been in a situation, I think with Broken Mile, I was in this, this situation where I had I'd had maybe 20 reviews at the time. Only one of them was on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, and it was it was a negative review because that was you know that was the Obviously. only one that was actually right. on Rotten Tomatoes at the time. So when you Google search the film, the top six or seven, uh, you know, the top six or seven results were all very neg- a very negative picture of a movie that had had maybe thirteen out of twenty reviews, or maybe fifteen out of twenty reviews were supr- were quite positive, but the perception to the public in that early part of the release is like, well, this is, why would I want to watch this? And it helps, it doesn't help you move units and get people to watch it and bring in revenue when uh, the way the algorithm works and the ranking in Google works shows, you know, this this limited view of what the actual picture of the film is. And, and I always find that kind of frustrating too. What is the biggest lesson you learned in the making of Life Changer? Oh shit, um, hmm. That's a challenging one. Uh, I guess patience uh, to some degree. It took, <laughs> it, it took a while to get it made. Not as long as other movies I've been trying to get made have, have taken so far. But uh, but I there were there was two moments where we were greenlit before we were actually greenlit. So mm. uh, you know we we had uh, one set of investors uh, plus uh, Telefilm, which I thought was going to happen. Uh, and the, the, this uh, set of investors was on board if Telefilm was on board. Uh, and at that particular year, Telefilm had given – Telefilm is the Canadian funding body that puts government money toward movies. Uh, so in that particular round of funding, they'd said no to everybody that, they were, that, that I thought they were going to say no to. And they didn't say no to us. And then they brought us in for a couple meetings for over the course of about a month. And then at the end of that month, we got our no. So I thought, oh, we're, we're stepping up into a next development stream. And I had brought in uh, outside uh, international buyers as pre-sales, contingent on the idea that we'd have the other half of the budget from telephone. And that fell, fell apart. So that was the first year. And then the second year, we, had, we actually signed uh, financing agreements with people. We were greenlit. We were going to camera. Uh, and then once we started getting into a conversation about the number of shoot days that would be needed to pull off the film in a way that Abby and I felt uh, we needed. Uh, the investors were used to making movies that were like 1.2, 1.3 million dollar uh, movie of the week type movies, where they would shoot them in 15 days. They bring in their one American actor or two American actors, um, and and just sort of rush it out. Uh, and I was pushing, even though we had a lower budget than that, I was pushing. No, we need like 20 to 23 days to do this right. It's an effects yeah. movie. Uh, even that's pretty, pretty tight, but in order to properly get the performances out of people in order to properly, I, uh, my argument was we need more days and we can do it if we change the way we budget it to this and cut some of this fringe off, you know, and, and that's kind of the last thing an investor wants to hear necessarily. Um, but I was, that, that argument started up in our, in the second time we were green led essentially. And they, they just decided to pull their offer and go with a different movie they financed, um, under with for more money essentially they put more money down on a different movie shot it in less days uh and that that was that was frustrating but then when when i finally got to make it i got to do it in 22 days uh i got to do it with partners that supported the vision 
and uh, and really did a pretty decent re- release for us. So I think it came together in a way that was it probably could have come together in a way with more budget and bigger actors and it would be a different film at that point. But in the low budget indie sort of version of it, it's probably the best it could have been given the, the, the resources we had and the time we had. So I'm kind of glad those first two fell apart because it ended up, I, I feel like we probably had a better film the third time uh, that we were greenlit than the one, the, the one that we would have had the first time because I, the, the script still needed, probably still needed more work or the second time where, I feel like the producers, uh, the financiers we working we were working with would have been um, difficult. Let's put it that way. The 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 key the key term I think here is persistence, man. And if you don't have it, you'll never make it in this in this business. It's just keep 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 trucking along, keep trucking along. Which I think mm-hmm. one of the biggest one of the most profound things I think you said in the entire documentary was. I was chasing the dream so long, I didn't realize I was living it. And that was such a powerful statement because so many of us always are looking for that thing. Like we've not, we're not successful until we do this or we win the Oscar or we win this or whatever BS that we talk to ourselves in. But when you realize you're like, you know, especially guys like you and me who've been doing this for so long, 20 odd years, you look back and you're like, I've been living the dream. You know, it, it's not exactly the way I wanted to because it's never exactly the way you want to. And I've spoken to, I've spoken to the lottery ticket winners. Uh, you know, I've, I've I've had those conversations. I understand, and, and even they are just like, this is not what I planned. Um, yeah. And even after they win, sometimes a lottery ticket, you're like, uh, now what? <laughs> like, you know, and they and they and whatever they want from that point on doesn't go exactly. So, but. If you, I just thought it was such a profound statement that it was chasing the dream so long that I didn't realize I was living it. Uh, when did you come to that realization? I think it's a perspective thing um, and kind of just re- looking at myself and where my place in the world and realizing like I'm pretty lucky in terms of the opportunities that have come to me or that have, I've been able to generate for myself. Um, and looking at the reality of this landscape of the filmmaking business as it is right now and, re- and, and just realizing like, uh, you know, I, I do to some degree, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start by saying this. I know that I have a degree of privilege, even though I'm, I'm a nobody and I, I'm not particularly wealthy and, uh, you know, I did, I, I had a, at best a lower middle class upbringing. Um, I'm still pretty privileged when it comes to uh, what I've been able to generate in my career so far when lots of other people haven't been able to do that for lots of different reasons, uh, whether it's systemic or whether they, they just never had the opportunity to have the resources necessary or whatever decisions were made that brought them on their path. Um, so on a perspective level, I, I, I can I can look and say, you know, I, I don't have it so bad compared to a lot of people. That, that was one realization. I think the other side of that is that is just sort of realizing that in, in a very like, esoteric Conrad kind of way where the journey is more important than the destination. If I look back over the last 20 years of my life and all the different things I've gotten to do and the countries I've gotten to visit and the, the films I've gotten to create and the people I've gotten to meet and, and the rooms I've been in that I, as a kid, I would have been like, are you, you fucking kidding me? You're, you're drinking Chivas Regal with George Romero right now. And, and Guillermo del Toro just walked out the door 20 minutes ago. You know, it's like, that those moments, if I look at those and, and go, okay, fine, I, maybe I haven't made, you know, my version of In the Mouth of Madness yet, or what, you know, whatever. I haven't, I haven't, you know, I'm not John Carpenter, and I'm never going to be. Uh, I'm, but I am Justin McConnell. I'm, I, I, I've done what I've done, and I, the hope is, is that I can continue to make more stuff, whether it's bigger or not, doesn't necessarily matter to me. Better is what matters. Um, you know, self-improvement, uh, continuing to evolve whoever I am as an artist in a way that I'm happy enough that when I die, I look back and go, OK, well, maybe you didn't make, you know, uh, Avengers part 14. And, and that's not even one of my goals, uh, but I can get into that in a second. But like maybe you didn't direct a 200 million dollar blockbuster, but some geek kid somewhere on their video collection or in their file library, I guess, because it'll be the future and physical media won't necessarily be the same, uh, has a Justin McConnell selection somewhere. But he appreciated the work you did. Maybe a lot of somebody's. It doesn't as look back and go, you know, you impacted somebody at least. Uh, that's more than I think a lot of people can ask for in life. 
So in a very sort of existential kind of way, really existential kind of way, if we really think about existence and how every single one of us is just like this tiny grain of sand on a vast beach on a planet in a massive universe. Uh, and in terms of the, the history of that universe, our lifetime is, is like comparable to the lifetime of a gnat. Like we do not matter on a cosmic existential scale. And most of the stuff we create is at best uh, trivia for the next hundred years at the at best. That's Even hugely best. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yes. Yeah. At, at best, probably not, probably not even that long. So all you really can do in life is do what makes you happy and do what fulfills you. And the goal is never going to fulfill you because you're just going to have another goal after that. But the pursuit of that goal can be incredibly fulfilling if you just open your fucking eyes and look. Amen. Preach, brother. Preach. Preach. <laughs> That's probably where I'm coming from. Now, um, I'm going to ask you a, few, uh, a couple questions to ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Run. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> most the most common answer to that question in my show is run run away no but yeah. we say we say that well that's a, like that that goes into another question like why no, do we keep why, why why do we keep doing this it's like the most well, abusive exactly relationship relationship we've ever been in I, I know exactly why though it's because if somebody tells you run and you run then you weren't meant to be a filmmaker if yeah. somebody tells you run and you, fuck you grandpa then you were meant to be a filmmaker that's it's that simple it's a litmus test it's a it's a and that's kind of what the documentary is too. It's a litmus test. It's a way for you to look from one perspective of one career and a bunch of different interviews from a bunch of different careers, spelling out to you kind of the reality of things. And if you watch that and go, oh man, that's too hard. It's not for me. Great. You just determined that it's too hard and it's not for you. But if you, you look at it- And you saved a decade. <laughs> yeah. So you've saved, the, you, you can now pursue something that you, uh, that works for you. Mm -hmm. But if you watch it or if you, you know, if you listen to a podcast like this or, you you know, your parents or whoever else tell you you're never going to make it. It's not it's not a career for you. Ever, look at all the thousands of people doing it and they're not making it. You know, even this guy who made this fucking documentary. I mean, would you, would you call him a success? You know, the, these sort of <laughs> these sort of expressions, these things that come at you constantly in your career and they never stop. I still I'm still got doubt all the time. It's just part right. of being a filmmaker. If none of that sways you from your path, guess what? You're a filmmaker. That's, I think that's what, that's what matters. That's why we say run. Um, and uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, God damn it. Um, <laughs> I hate this question. I, know. I have a thousand favorite films. Um, but I, I'm going to just do what I use as my three most influential to what got me started in my career. I'm not, they're not the best films of all time. They're favorites of mine on a on an importance level to my own experience in life. Sure. But I'd be here all day if I was listening to sure. favorite films because I so the first one's the Monster Squad because it was the yes. movie that my my dad rented for yes. me when I was like twelve that got me gave me the horror bug. It got me started. Well, I mean, I think I saw the Lost Boys before that, and I obviously like Disney stuff like Mr. Boogity and mm -hmm. uh, you know Gremlins and all that. I'd already watched that, but the Monster Squad is one that I distinctly remember. I still remember. I, I would have been. I probably was 12. I was 12. I remember walking into a video store. It was a new release that week. It was sitting on top. It wasn't a new release. I don't know. It was sitting at the top of a, of a shelf. And I remember pointing at it and looking at my dad and he's like, okay. And that kind of opened a window to me to go, okay, I, I love this. Uh, that, that movie, uh, as, as silly as I'm sure some people think it is, is, is such a sort of whole classic to me in that, um, it, it implements, all the creativity that you can you can have in film in one sort of like easy digestible pill that a kid can sort of get obsessed with the um, the same as I'm sure the Universal monster movies were for older generations. Um, you know, you, you talk to an effects artist and they're always like, oh, Dick Smith's work on this and this is why I want to. You know, everybody has those sort of watershed movies. The Monster Squad was one for me. Okay. Um, and then uh, in the Mouth of Madness, uh, John Carpenter's in the Mouth of Madness, another horror film. Um, strictly because a lot of my thought patterns growing up uh, fell into the idea 
of uh, of story within a story and metatextualism and uh, existentialism and the idea of spaces between dimensions. And I was I was very much a a, a cosmic horror nerd growing up. Uh, and in the mouth of madness is a movie that uh, just for some reason just like stuck in my head and spoke to me. And like I, I feel like. I, I'm always sort of chasing that high in terms of, in terms of like the type of movies I love. And, and this, around the same time, Wes Craven's New Nightmare came out. And that was like a, a duology of two films that both sort of dealt with the, the nature of storytelling itself. Um, and I, which always fascinated me. Uh, and, and, but I think that really drove me to think about story from the outside perspective and how it actually, you know, reflects on, on the war. It's not just the story. It's what does the story mean? I think that really, um, in the mouth of madness was a big one for me. Oh, the last one's hard though. Um, cause I could literally say anything, uh, but I'm going to say the big Lebowski and the reason <laughs> I'm gonna say nice. the big Lebowski is because it's my chicken soup movie. It's a movie that I could put on and I've physically been felt like if I'm physically sick, like I've got a cold or whatever else I could put it on. And by the end of the movie, I'm, I've forgotten the cold to some degree, like even though physiologically I'm still sick. Uh, somehow it puts me in a mental place where I'm like, eh, shit ain't so bad. Like that's... <laughs> because you're the dude. You become the dude. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe on a subconscious <laughs> level you get about, the... Uh, about Jeff Dow, the guy the dude's based on, how he'd yeah. go to Sundance and he'd just start vacuuming a party in the middle of the night. Anyway, that's a whole other side. Dude, J J I was at a party. I was shooting my movie at Sundance and uh, yeah. Jeff, Jeff Dow just walks into our party. Oh yeah. Nice. Like it, he's just, and he's over there like, that's Jeff Dow. This guy's just the dude. I'm like, Nice. Yeah. <laughs> but again, those all, I know those all sound like kind of film bro-y choices. And, uh, I, and I'll, I'll fully admit, like I'm a, I'm a guy. I grew up with these movies and this, and this is kind of, I think an important thing to mention too, is that, um, especially for our generation, uh, that golden ticket thing was very much focused on like dude filmmakers, right? Like Tarantino's and the Kevin Smith's and all that sort of thing or thing. And it's taken me a while over the last 20 years to kind of pull myself out of that very male centric focused storytelling uh, bubble because, you know, you're always told write what you know and you're always told like, uh, you know, so I wrote the stories that appealed to me the most. And as I was growing up, the stories that appealed to me the most were like Starship Troopers and fucking mm -hmm. like, like very guy stuff, like, like the kind of movies that absolutely women can like them. Uh, but they're very much like there'd be the stuff that would be on a, a frat boys wall as a poster or something like that. Right. Uh, and I, so I've spent a good long time sort of diversifying my film taste. So when I say these are the most important movies to me and the most formative movies to me, uh, that those are starting points, but my world opened up so much, especially after I moved to Toronto and I started renting rare films from all over the world and going to, you know, cult video stores and, you know, expanding into world cinema. And uh, I just, I, I can't really answer the three best films question anymore. Sure. Actually. But you did a, you did a fantastic, by the way. It was fantastic okay. answers. Fantastic nice. answers. Like now, where, now, where can people find uh, Clapboard Jungle and uh, any of your other work? So Clapboard Jungle right now, if you wanted to watch it, uh, it's on VOD across North America. So anywhere you rent your movies uh, on, it's, Go to clapboardjungle.com. It's got all the platforms listed on the buy sell page. You can you can find it and watch it now. Uh, but in April, uh, Arrow Video is putting it out on a super crazy special edition Blu-ray. Nice. And it'll be up on the Arrow Video channel, their new uh, streaming app, which actually has a really awesome uh, catalog of, of stuff up there already. And they're doing bonus features on an actual streaming app for almost everything, which is great. Um, so uh, in April, if you want to get the Blu-ray... I added it up, and if you watched all the material on the Blu-ray, including all of the commentary tracks, it's about 24 hours and 45 minutes of material on one disc, which is, uh, if you want to go deeper into the film, like, there's another five hours of extended interviews. There's, uh, uh, I put together a guest commentary track specifically for that release, which is Barbara Crampton, Gigi Saul Guerrero, John McNaughton, Richard Stanley, Adam Mason, and myself. So, like, that's just us shooting the shit about film for for hundred minutes, just as a bonus. Kind of thing. <laughs> um, nice. So that's coming out. Uh, so yeah, clapboardjungle.com will clean and connect you with everything you need to know, social media and all that sort of thing. I'm pretty open on social. Like you can just find me through my name. Uh, but my company website is unstableground.net. And uh, yeah, add me on, on, on every social media platform, but TikTok because I'm not on there and uh, LinkedIn because I don't check it. 
So that's <laughs> me too. I don't check LinkedIn ever. <laughs> uh, I, I get their their notifications all the time, and I'm like, I'm sure this works as a as a professional platform, and uh, nothing against the company, but I just I've never been able to adopt an active use of it for whatever reason. Fair enough. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your journey with us in Clapboard Jungle, sharing uh, your journey with us here at the show. Uh, I appreciate you dropping the raw and truth uh, knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So I appreciate Well, at least it. as much as I, I I perceive it, right? Everybody's perception and story is going to be different. Yes. It's just is what it is. <laughs> thank you, my friend. I thank you, my friend. No problem. Have a good one. I want to thank Justin for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you so much, Justin. Again, I highly recommend you watch Clapboard Jungle, and you can get a link for that in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash four six three. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com, subscribe and leave an honest review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 